Cheshire's children are the fifth great-grandchildren of Cheshire Ahud, who was the head of the Lake Banda Indians, and his territory included Lakes Union, Washington, and Sammamish. So I know he's glad to see his relatives at home singing their songs and greeting their land. And I want to say welcome. On January 6th, descendants of the original inhabitants of the Duwamish village that once existed on the southern shore of Lake Union blessed the ground on which the Northwest Native Canoe Center Carving House will be built. The $4.7 million facility will provide a place where the tradition of Coast Salish canoe culture can be rejuvenated. The tradition of Salish canoe building goes back thousands of years. Native canoes not only carried passengers and cargo, but also a sense of identity for Native people that spiritually connected them to the earth. The canoe carving house fulfills a dream that began over 50 years ago. Um, so it was 50 years ago that this, uh, it was but a, a dream of our uh, executive director at the time, Bernie White Bear. There was a, um, a takeover that had taken place here March 8th of 1970 through our founder, Bernie White Bear, and about a hundred other colleagues. And they were determined to have a cultural slash educational slash um, social um, kind of a center for Native Americans. There was nothing that existed here before that time. A lot of poverty was, uh, was afoot here in the urban centers, not only in Seattle, but Denver, uh, Los Angeles, New York, Minneapolis. So when they did the takeover, first and foremost, they wanted to have a cultural center for, uh, for Native Americans, for urban natives in this uh, city. Part of that, uh, this urban native center was to have access to uh, the water. And what that meant was they wanted to have um, actual canoes, tribally made canoes made through native hands. And they wanted to make sure that was accessible to water for natives. So therefore they struck a deal with the city to have access to, uh, to the uh, uh, Puget Sound. Unfortunately, the original spot they had chosen for them was not friendly terrain. It was rather difficult for, for uh, foot traffic to make it to the water. So they moved it from that spot, which is here at Daybreak Star, down to uh, Lake Union. And first it was at the southeast corner of Lake Union. Uh, but uh, even that was a kind of a difficult process because there were other um, organizations that was also being placed down there. And uh, they eventually uh, was able to secure a spot for us on the southwest corner of Southwest Lake Union. And that was, uh, at first, it seemed like a wonderful um, location. So right at about 1996, Bernie and uh, the United Indians Organization, we attempted to uh, get our canoe house started. Uh, at that point, uh, even then, money was very difficult to come by. And so uh, we couldn't gain enough momentum at the time of Bernie's passing, which was right at about 2000. And uh, so it kind of lingered uh, for roughly about 18 years. I came on board 2017, uh, probably about a year and a half later though, I decided to really start putting effort into trying to rejuvenate uh, Bernie's dream. And uh, you know, we saved the renderings of it and it, they looked so magnificent, I just, thought we just cannot let this uh, die. And so we uh, had knocked on numerous doors, uh, talked to some, uh, some great uh, legislators in our state system. We talked to uh, people who worked within the King County, uh, Representative Gene Cole Wells. We uh, gained um, uh, economic assistance through Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal. So these various avenues we were able to uh, gain these kind of uh, resources to make this happen. And uh, roughly about November of uh, 2022, we were finally able to gain this, the, uh, the amount of dollars necessary to complete the uh, project. And so right away I said, we're going to have a 
uh, honoring ceremony uh, and uh, before they raise the price on us again. Get, to get decided on a dotted line and uh, let's get things rolling. Seattle's history is marred by its treatment of Native Americans. In 1865, the city of Seattle passed an ordinance expelling all Native people from its boundaries. Most were forced to move across Puget Sound to the Suquamish Reservation. But Cheshiahood refused to leave the lake where he had lived his whole life. He was a canoe carver and a guide and had endeared himself to the white interlopers. He was allowed to stay with his second wife, Madeline, on a homestead located at the foot of what's now Shelby Street. He was, uh, he was a sub-chief to Seattle, I guess. He was, he was my, gram my grandma Julia's dad, and, and he was friends with one of the original interlopers named David Denny. Other people would call him a pioneer. Cheshire, who was invaluable to the settlement and, and showing people what the country was like. The interlopers got here without not knowing a thing. So they taught him about seafood and food from the sea and what to eat locally to survive. So anyway, um, I think he became an integral part of the community because he taught people how to survive. In 1906, Cheshiahood's second wife, Madeline, was near death. Cheshiahood sold some of his land and used the money to hold a three-day-long potlatch for her. Friends and relatives from all over the region came to see Madeline as the end approached. It was the last authentic expression of Duwamish spirituality to be held in Seattle for many decades. After Madeline passed, Cheshiahood left Seattle and moved to the Suquamish Reservation where he died in 1910. The land where Cheshiahood spent most of his life is now surrounded by the offices of tech companies and would hardly be recognizable to him. But the songs sung at the January 6th blessing ceremony would have reassured him that his culture is not dead and will hopefully endure long after the towering edifices of modern commerce crumble into dust. <laughs>